Now that we have learned the basics of acids and bases, let us take a look at some slightly more advanced concepts or questions related to the topic. We have learned that reactive metals can react with acids to produce salt and hydrogen gas. Uh, so in this particular example, when aluminium reacts with an acid, we will only start to see bubbles or effervescence after a few minutes. So why is that so? Now when aluminium reacts with an acid, aluminium is reactive enough to react with the acid, so it should produce a salt and hydrogen gas. So theoretically we should see bubbles uh, or the chemistry term is called effervescence. However, why is it that we only see bubbles after a few minutes is because of this. Um, aluminium has a very high tendency to react with oxygen in the air and form a layer of aluminium oxide on its surface. So when you throw this piece of aluminium into an acid, the immediate reaction that occurs is not between aluminium and the acid, but rather it is between aluminium oxide and the acid. So a common answer that students will give is that there's no reaction. But that's not correct because aluminium oxide, if you can recall, is an amphoteric oxide. So yes, it can actually react with an acid. So and when it reacts with an acid, it actually forms salt and water. The key observation here is that there is no gas produced. Um, and since there's no gas produced, you do not see bubbles at the very start. Only when all your oxide layer has been fully reacted, only then will aluminium react with the acid, only then will hydrogen gas be formed, and only then will there be bubbles observed. In another related reaction, um, where lead reacts with sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid, even though lead is reactive enough, um, we will only see the bubbles for a very short period of time, and then the reaction will stop. So why is that so? Let us first look at the chemical equation. Lead can react with sulfuric acid and when it happens, when it reacts, it forms hydrogen gas and the salt is lead to sulfate. Now the key thing about this is that lead to sulfate is insoluble in water. So when the product of a metal with an acid produces a salt that's insoluble in water, what's going to happen is this. Imagine I have lead reacting with the acid and as it undergoes reaction it forms a layer of salt that is insoluble in water meaning it's going to form an insoluble layer of lead sulfate and once the insoluble layer forms it acts as a barrier to prevent sulfuric acid from reaching the lead so as a result um, the lead that's embedded within the sulfate can no longer react with the acid and the reaction will stop prematurely. A very similar um, scenario would be when lead carbonate reacts with sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid, um, the reaction will also stop only after a while. Now why is that so? Technically, when lead carbonate reacts with um, sulfuric, uh, hydrochloric acid, we are going to end up with lead to chloride, carbon dioxide gas, and water. So when carbon dioxide gas is produced, we will see effervescence. But this effervescence will stop only after a while. Why is that so? Again, it's because lead to chloride is insoluble in water. So we have lead carbonate reacting with 
hydrochloric acid now as the reaction goes on it forms lead chloride all right so it forms an insoluble layer of lead 2 chloride and this insoluble layer of lead 2 chloride will act as a barrier to prevent any further reaction to prevent hydrochloric acid from reaching the lead carbonate so therefore the reaction will stop now in this question what are the possible salts formed when sulfuric acid is reacted with limiting amounts of sodium hydroxide um, it seems like a straightforward straightforward question because we have learned that when sulfuric acid reacts with sodium hydroxide um, the salt form is simply sodium sulfate and then the other product is water All right. however um, the concept here is that sulfuric acid is a dibasic acid and what's interesting about dibasic acids is that one unit of the acid will produce two units of hydrogen ions and the other interesting thing about um, dibasic acids is that um, when it produces the two units of hydrogen ions it will dissociate or it will ionize stepwise All right, what exactly do we mean by stepwise it means that it will dissociate one at a time so as shown uh, or as mentioned dibasic and tribasic acids when they dissociate in water they will dissociate stepwise they will release one hydrogen ion at a time so we are looking at the example of sulfuric acid which is a dibasic acid so when it ionizes it will first release one hydrogen ion and when it loses a unit of positive charge the remaining ion will carry a unit of negative charge and this ion can further dissociate in the second reaction to produce another hydrogen ion and then your sulfate ion so if you can recall when an acid reacts with an alkali when it reacts with an alkali the salt form would contain a cation from the alkali and it contains the anion from the acid so for di or tri basic acids now we will have more than one anion that are possible we can, uh, for example for sulfuric acid we can actually have this hydrogen sulfate ion we can also have the sulfate ions so when we react with sodium hydroxide there are actually two possible salts that can form we can actually have sodium combined with hydrogen sulfate that's one possible salt we can have another possible salt where we have sodium combining with sulfate so the two possible salts would be NaHSO4 and the other one would be Na2SO4 now this is a very common question that students uh, tend to ask why is it that in the chemical equation for the reaction of an acid with aqueous ammonia water is not produced students um, will tend to recall that acid plus alkali produces salt and water but if we try to write the chemical equation for ammonia with an acid you see that water doesn't feature in the equation now firstly water is still produced just that is it is not shown explicitly in the equation uh, but however if you take note that the symbols are all aqueous meaning that the reactants and the products are dissolved in water now the reason why water doesn't appear in the equation is because when the when writing the formula for aqueous ammonia the hydroxides are not shown if you recall um, alkalis produces hydroxides and water so ammonia 
aqueous ammonia actually um, would react with water to form ammonium ions and hydroxide ions. So it's for this particular reason that we do not show the, the formation of the hydroxide ions. So um, in the writing of the equation of aqueous ammonia with an acid, we do not show the water, the formation of the water as well. Not that water is not formed, it's just that it, it is not shown in the equation. Now for this question, what is the change in pH when aluminum hydroxide is added in excess to dilute hydrochloric acid? So um, the reaction goes like this, we have dilute hydrochloric acid in solution and then we're going to add aluminum hydroxide. Um, firstly, before the addition of any aluminum hydroxide, you would expect the pH of dilute hydrochloric acid to be around 1. Why is that so? Because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Now what happens when we add a bit of aluminum hydroxide? Aluminum hydroxide, like aluminum oxide, is an amphoteric oxide. Or, or rather, it's an amphoteric substance. So it's going to react with your hydrochloric acid. And when it reacts with your hydrochloric acid, we're going to have less and less of your hydrochloric acid remaining. And what happens when we have less hydrochloric acid remaining? We will have less hydrogen ions present. And that means that the pH will slowly increase. Right? There will come a time when all your hydrochloric acid is completely reacted. And at this point in time, the solution will be neutral. So it will slowly increase to pH 7. Now the key a key part of a key feature of this question is what happens after all your hydrochloric acid has been reacted. After all your hydrochloric acid has been reacted, if we were to continue to add aluminium hydroxide, the question to ask is will the pH change? So when we add aluminium hydroxide in excess, will the pH change? The key feature um, that we need to take note is that aluminum ox hydroxide is insoluble in water. Right? Remember only SPCA hydroxides are soluble in water. So aluminum hydroxide is insoluble in water. So it's a base and not an alkali. So what happens when we add aluminum hydroxide in excess? It is not going to dissolve in water. All right? It is not going to produce hydroxide ions and since it doesn't produce any hydroxide ions the pH of your solution will not change so in this case when we add aluminum hydroxide in excess to dilute hydrochloric acid the pH change will be from 1 to 7 Right. Beyond 7, when we add an excess of aluminum hydroxide, it's not going to dissolve, it's not going to produce any hydroxide ions, so the pH will remain constant at 7. In a related question where now we look at a change in pH when sodium hydroxide is added in excess to dilute hydrochloric acid. So once again, we have hydrochloric acid which is a strong acid so the pH to start with is around 1 and what happens when we add sodium hydroxide to it is that it will undergo an acid base neutralization my acid is going to be reacted so the pH will slowly increase and at a certain point in time all my hydrochloric acid will be fully reacted so the pH will be 7 now what happens after this point. After this point when we add excess NaOH, so again the key feature here is that 
NaOH is soluble in water. Alright, so after all the hydrochloric acid has been reacted, when we add an excess of sodium hydroxide, it will actually dis dissolve in water to produce hydroxide ions. And if you can recall, hydroxide ions will cause the pH to increase. So from pH 7, it will again increase further with more and more hydroxide being formed. So as we continue to add sodium hydroxide in excess, eventually the whole solution will become sodium hydroxide. And the pH of sodium hydroxide is around 14 because it is a strong alkali. So in this case, because the substance added to hydrochloric acid is soluble in water, the pH change is from 1 to 14 rather than 1 to 7. Now for the last um, question, what is the ionic equation for the reaction of sulfuric acid with calcium hydroxide? This reaction is essentially a neutralization reaction. So the writing of ionic equations for neutralization is very simple. Uh, if you can recall, ionic equations only show the ions directly involved in the reaction. So in a neutralization reaction, the ion that is responsible for acids, for the reactions of acids, is hydrogen ions. And the ion responsible for the reaction of alkalis is hydroxide ions. And when you react hydrogen ion with hydroxide ion, the product will be water. So for any acid reacting with any alkali, the ionic equation is simply H plus plus OH minus gives you water. If you don't believe, you can actually write out the chemical equation for this particular reaction. And again, you split all the aqueous substances into their ions and you cancel the um, spectator ions. I can assure you, um, regardless of what acid or alkali you are using, you will always end up with this equation shown.